welcome Bernard George to this class today. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to stand before you this morning, uh, such a prestigious group of individuals. I'm telling you, first prayers, and uh, I look back in the back, and I just saw my boss, my former boss, walk, walk in. Mike Avery, stand up. Stand up, Mike. There you go. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. <laughs> well, Mike contributed to my uh, development as a planner, and I'm always grateful to him. And, uh, and of uh, exposing me to first prayers also. We used to come here uh, during Lenten season and get the ashes and do the things. And, you know, uh, I came along reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> but I found I've gotten more and more comfortable, and it's a pleasure to be back here. I'd just like to say a, a brief prayer, too. Dear Lord, uh, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And I want to thank Reverend Anna Strait for inviting me to speak, and also Jim Copeland for your support down through the years. Um, you know, we talked briefly by email about what you wanted me to speak on, and, and Jim was concerned about this adult education committee and how the churches developed here in the city of New Bern. And he asked me to speak and a uh, few, well, as it got closer and closer, and I want to tell you, I didn't sleep well last night. <laughs> you are an imposing crowd. <laughs> but actually, I've learned more and more, and uh, a lot of what I had conjectured, I really found a lot of information on it. I am not an expert on the churches. OK, but my family has lived here in New Bern, uh, you know, the 18th century. And uh, we were free blacks who moved here from Virginia. And uh, I'm one of the families that did not go north. We stayed the course. So there are a lot of uh, stories that I learned through my parents and my grandparents that I, I shared with my children. I want to. Uh, recognize my wife, my son, and my youngest grandchild, <laughs> Vanna Bernard George, and his wife, Tiffany. And I'm glad to have you here, too, yeah. giving me some support. <laughs> you know, uh, Pastor Strait mentioned uh, history and how important it is. And uh, one of my favorite scriptures is Joshua fourth chapter, first through the eighth verse, where God commands the Israelites to cross the Jordan River, and he stopped uh, miraculously and stopped the flow of the river, and then directed them to go back in the middle of the river and pick up boulders, stones of remembrance, and build an altar so that future generations will know how God has brought them forth. And I'm, I'm sorry about my tears and my emotions, because after studying this, I realized that it was only God. It was only God who brought us from slavery to freedom. It was only God who brought us through the rigors of Jim Crow, where my parents could not earn a good living for a family of 11. <laughs> It's hard to earn a good living for a family too, huh? <laughs> but, you know, uh, I think about it and it brings, I'm very emotional from time to time. So forgive these, but I'm also emotional because I just love life. And God has blessed me with the best life anyone could have. It uh, blessed me with one of the best bosses, right? <laughs> I don't know about that sometimes. <laughs> 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 it blessed me with a great life. And I want to share some of what God has brought us from. And in reading this, this, this history, these stones of remembrance, it just brings back, it fills my heart up. 
And, um, and so I want to talk a bit about the churches. My title today is the Genesis of the African-American Church in New Bern. And, and Jim, I told Jim before I came that last year it was hot in here. And uh, he was so kind to bring me a tissue and wipe my face and whatever. <laughs> and I told Jim that that wouldn't be necessary this time. I bought my own. I didn't expect tears, though, but it does fill me up because I spent 25 years uh, with the uh, city of New Bern as a zoning administrator, and I had many crowds just like this through those 25 years, and they wanted to roast me from time to time. So it's good to, to be among friends, good Christian friends, and, you know, it fills me up. But anyway, I'm going to start off with an introduction about the antebellum period in religion. Uh, during the antebellum period in North Carolina, there were no independent black churches because it was against the law for black people to congregate together because of the fear of uprising, slave revolts, et cetera, et cetera. And so all the, all the churches actually, Jim, started out together. Black people in the church, white people in the church, black people at the back of the church, hello back there, <laughs> and uh, white people at the front, or black people in the balcony. But we were all in there together, and we heard much of the same sermons. Now, um, when Asbury came here, the United, uh, where the Methodist Episcopal Church got started here, and we're getting ready to... Uh, 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 celebrate his 250th anniversary here. There were black and white parishioners who made it up, made up that church, and uh, even here in First Prayers, there were uh, black parishioners. We always mention Kitty, uh, Kitty Green Stanley, and her husband, John, John Stanley, and, and, and the 13 original members of this great church. Well, this is just the case with all of the denominations that were here. They came here, the Episcopalians, the Methodists, the uh, Presbyterians, even the Catholics, the Methodists, the Baptists. They all had that set up. Well, with black people, African-American people, no single institution was of greater importance to black people than the church. It was so important because the story of Christ is the story of, of, of triumph over evil, triumph and suffering, and especially the story of Moses. That's the most uh, popular story in the Bible for black folk. And it mirrored our sojourn here in America. W.E.B. Du Bois expressed the church significance as the center of economic activity as well as that of amusement, education, and social intercourse. So the church was a center of black community. Many ways the church started out for black people as a hush harbor, uh, uh, a bush harbor. We familiar with that, right? That's, you, there were revivals. During the Great Revival of the early 1800s, people flooded out to hear these revivalists, and they would go out in the woods many times, or in an area where they could have these revivals, and since there was not much, uh, uh, they didn't have the furniture, et cetera, they would uh, put, uh, put up a temporary structure which was a bush harbor. Anybody heard of bush harbor? All right, we got a few people have about as old as I am. <laughs> but, okay, slaves had the same situation because they wanted to go out and worship God in their own way together. And so they were sometimes called hush harbors because it was quiet. I heard the song, the spiritual, hush, hush. Somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush. Somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. What shall I do? All right. 
And so, and sometimes they'd even put wet uh, quilts around the area that muffle the sounds so that they would not be found out. They would not be exposed. The African-American churches got started nationally in Philadelphia and in New York. Uh, the AME and the AME Zion Church, I'll give you a little example of why there is a difference. The AME Church started in Philadelphia. Richard Allen, we heard of the Free African Society, which is a benevolent society that supported free blacks who were just thrown off the shackles of slavery and maybe needed funeral expenses, medical expenses, help, etc. So they paid into this fund. And from that, Richard Allen, uh, he was a member of the, AM, uh, of the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, and they were getting the same kind of treatment there. Uh, they were, were not allowed to receive the sacraments with other white uh, uh, parishioners. They had to wait. Uh, they had to sit in the balcony, et cetera. So eventually they left the church and founded the AME Church in Philadelphia. The same thing went on in New York City, where my church, the AME Zion Church, they're both the same, pretty much the same. They came out of the Methodist Episcopal Church. We in New York attach Zion to the end of our name to distinguish us from the AME church. And these two denominations grew separately. And in 1816, the AME church received its first bishop and it, and it was incorporated as a denomination. The AME Zion church five years later in 1821 did the same thing. We had our first bishop. And so the second bishop of the AME Zion Church, though, who came, uh, who was elected in about 1826, believe it or not, was from New Bern. Bishop Christopher Rush. He was, he was an escaped slave who left uh, New Bern, escaped from New Bern, went to New York City, found his way into Zion and worked with them and, and rose up through the ranks. And he was a very long standing bishop. He was a bishop for about 50 years. Wow. So there was a tie between the AME Zion Church, the AME Church, and New Bern. Um, Andrew Chapel. Andrew Chapel. Uh, was started out as the New Bern Methodist Society, founded the Methodist Church. And it was located over on Church Alley uh, on Hancock Street. There, the same thing occurred. Blacks worshiped in the back. They had separate services. And the same as here with the Presbyterian Church, Episcopalian Church, and other churches where blacks and whites worship together because down south here, it was required that they had to worship together. Now, eventually, the churches divided, and that was the crux of Jim Copeland's uh, question. How did it happen? Well, it happened because of the schism going on in this country during the 1830s and 40s and 50s, leading up to the Civil War. And what was the major impetus for that? The major impetus was um, Nat Turner's revolt in Virginia, where 59 whites were killed. He was in, and he was a free, he was a free African-American, was not a slave. And because of that revolt, and because of the number of people that were killed, there was a backlash all across this country. And there were more and more laws enacted restricting the rights of free African-Americans like my George family and other families here in New Bern. In fact, those restrictions were so strong that Kitty Green Stanley, her family, they eventually left New Bern. There was a great exodus 
from New Bern in the 1840s and 50s. As a result, uh, uh, in fact, the, uh, the backlash from Nat Turner's revolt up in Virginia, right, Chief? You from Virginia, right? Talk to me. <laughs> well, as a result of that, here in North Carolina, there was a Constitution Amendment that removed the right to vote for male, free African Americans who owned property. And that was, a major, that was a major lick. Because if you don't have the right to vote, then you're really not a citizen. And you are powerless. So the well to do in this city, they left. Many of them went to Oberlin, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, points west. Many others went to Philadelphia, New York. And some, like Christopher Rush at first, they skedaddled all the way to Canada because in 1850 there was the Fugitive Slave Act that required that slaves, escaped slaves, be sought after and brought back to the plantation, to their owners. And they would be sought anywhere in the United States and there were bounties put out. So this was a very crucial time and there was a major drain on the on the, on the economics, on the community of African Americans here in New Bern. So I'm gonna to try to stay with that. Uh, the, the, the first Methodist meeting house was erected, as I said, on Hancock Street. But in 1843, 1845, this is practically 10 years after the uh, Constitution Amendment, removing uh, uh, blacks in the voting rolls and also placing more restrictions, black codes on free blacks and anyone else who looked like me. Uh, in 1843, 1845, there was a major schism in the Methodist Episcopal Church. And that's when the, uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church South was established. Uh, they withdrew because there was a bishop down in Georgia who owned slaves and they told him that you could not be a good Methodist if you owned slaves, special bishop, and he refused to let the slaves go, so they uh, excommunicated him. And so there was this huge issue in the South and the Southern Methodists withdrew from the Methodist Episcopal Church of America. At this time, we have uh, at, at uh, the Methodist Meeting House, the white members withdrew. They withdrew and built a church on New Street, the new Methodist church, and it was called Centenary. The, the, uh, for, the uh, Methodist meeting house was left to the African Americans, okay? At its next uh, general conference, we see uh, that the Methodist Meeting House, the name was changed to Andrews Chapel, and Centenary appears in the first minutes of that conference. Sure. I, I, yes. I think Centenary is celebrating this year their 250th year. That's right. So it's interesting to me that they're going way back instead of to that 1843, 1845 days for the 250th. Well, that's why I brought my wife here. <laughs> See, I learned that from you, Mike. Uh, uh, she's a member of Centenary, and she can explain that to you. Uh, but uh, um, the, the Methodists uh, uh, got started here in this city. What year? 1772. 1772. That's when uh, the Reverend who? Joseph Pilmore. Joseph Pilmore, you see who runs my house. <laughs> uh, he came to New Bern and preached his first sermon. I think it was on Christmas? Christmas Day. I learned a lot from her, that lady. And uh, so uh, that's why we're looking at 250 years. And with many of these dates, I know we're recording this and some of the churches that, I've ta that I'll be talking about will probably dispute some of my information um, because, you know, 250 years ago, who knows? You know, and history is to the, written by the victor. And, and whoever does the writing. But, 
And that's, that's why we're looking at 250 years. Uh, that church split. Black members stayed there and it became Andrew's Chapel, the white church, centenary. And the same thing happened with all the other denominations. Okay, so that eventually, and, and, and what was going on during this time was that there would be two services. There'd be a service for the white parishioners and a service for the black parishioners, maybe later on. Very rarely were they together. And when they were together, they were separated by racial lines. And we, and you know, we, we know that the law required it, social norms required it, all of that required it. And that's why I tear up when I think about them stones of remembrance, because we're all here together, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. We're back together. And that's worth celebrating. That's worth celebrating. Um, James Walker Hood came to New Bern January 17, 1864. And he was smart because he came right out the Emancipation Proclamation. Because New Bern and the South were still in the thrones of the Civil War. And a black man, I don't care if you were uh, uh, free or not, you're in a perilous, perilous uh, situation if you come south. And so he really, they sent, the Emmy Zion Church sent one missionary here, and he never made it. He turned around and said, no, his heart was faint. He wasn't like Reverend Strait there. <laughs> uh, but he never made it. And, and uh, James Walker Hood came as a missionary, and he was a powerful black man. He was a free Negro from Pennsylvania. Thank you. That's so kind of you. And uh, he, uh, he came to New Bern at the urging of Andrew's Chapel. We got to remember that in uh, April 1861, the Civil War started. Less than a year later, March 14, 1862, New Bern was, some say captured, I say liberated by Union forces. And New Bern became along the coast of North Carolina, along with Virginia, South Carolina, and the uh, Pea Islands of Georgia, uh, an outpost for the Union services. And behind those Union troops came evangelists and missionaries who were eager to claim congregations for their denominations. So uh, Andrews Chapel folk contacted the AME Zion Church and asked them for a minister of their own. James Walker Hood came here. And January 24th, 1864, Andrew Chapel members voted to align themselves with the AME Zion Church because New Bern was in the thrones of smallpox and it was against the law to assemble, he moved on to Beaufort, to Purvis Chapel, and brought them under the AME Zion banner also. He came back to New Bern when it was cleared somewhat and preached his first sermon at Andrew's Chapel on Easter morning, 1864. A month later, the bishop of the AME Zion Church Bishop J.J. Clinton came to New Bern, and it was said the city, uh, African-American community, celebrated greatly to see a bishop of their own color for once in their lives. And he came to New Bern, and he uh, brought in, at that time, Clinton Chapel AME Zion Church. And then in December 1864, the North Carolina Conference of the AME Zion Church was formed. And this was the first conference formed, as uh, the paper said, under the banner of Dixie. Uh, Andrew Chapel at that time became the mother church of AME Zionism in the South. The first church in the South. And it still carries that banner today. Um, and that's St. Peter's Church. 
It's, um, as I said, uh, my wife said in 1772, part of the first Methodist congregation was established here in New Bern. And in 1864, um, Abbey Zion Church was established. Well, what happened after 1864? Well, there was a gentleman here named George Rue. He, his mother was freeborn, therefore he was freeborn. His father was a slave. After he was born, she had, she had three kids by him and he was sold. They never saw him again. She married. She, George Rue was part of that group that left New Bern in the 1850s. He went off. And one of the things about leaving New Bern and leaving the state as free African Americans, you couldn't come back. Uh, you couldn't come back because you were considered seditious. You know, you were a bad example. How could uh, you tell a slave that they had no capacity for self-governance, autonomy, et cetera, and you got another black man standing beside them who is self-supporting, self-sufficient, and making a living. Uh, and um, uh, we can blame part of that, too, on Nat Turner. He was, he was free. And so there was this great fear that free African Americans, free colored people, would poison the slaves. So, you know, uh, we, we have the story of the, the greatest furniture maker, the person who started our furniture uh, uh, industry here in North Carolina, one of the biggest in the world. It was Thomas who? I tell you, my wife is smart. That's why I married her. <laughs> Thomas Day. Anybody familiar with Thomas Day? His, his furniture is, is basically in museums. He started the furniture uh, 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 industry here in North Carolina because of his meticulous craftsmanship. And, and um, in fact, as we talk about craftsmen, most of the African-Americans, slave and free, did a lot of the building, a major part of the building in this town and other areas. When they left uh, in the 1840s and 50s, New Bern, they traveled to New Haven, Connecticut, Boston, other points, and these craftsmen were known for their excellent craftsmen, craftsmanship, and they uh, uh, created a market for New Bern craftsmen. So they had to leave. They had to leave to make a better life for themselves. Um, as I said, my family was a, fa was a family that stayed here and toughed it out. Um, Clinton Chapel. The story of Clinton Chapel, that's, that's my story. Clinton Chapel is over in the Long Wharf community. I wish I had a map. I should have bought a map, but I've got some flyers here, and you can see it on the flyers. Um, it was a result of Fort Totten. People familiar with Fort Totten? Fort Totten was the biggest fort in, in, in this area. And it was basically constructed with African-American labor. In fact, at most of the camps around in this area, African-Americans went there seeking jobs. And so they would sit up in those camps, they would make their own camps, and they would go during the day to work and make whatever money they could. Fort Totten was there in the Lone Wolf area. The Lone Wolf area is that area uh, on the south side of Broad Street, all the way to Lawson Creek and the river. Um, over in that area, there, was a, uh, there were camps of African Americans. And whenever they gathered, you know, they would pray. They would have services, et cetera. And so out of that gathering there of craftsmen, of workers and laborers, uh, horse drivers, wagoneers, et cetera, coffin makers, they pulled together a prayer band. And a prayer band, according to uh, John Wesley, was a basic unit of service, uh, uh, of worship. And uh, they worship, and that's where 
my church got its beginning. Got its beginning in 1864 when Bishop Clinton came to New Bern and he went over to that camp and they saw that bishop. And when he organized them as a church, they took on his name and therefore Clinton Chapel, AME Zion Church in 1864. Um, in 1879, the church purchased a lot and, and four years later, three years later, they built their first church building. Now, most black churches, um, basically, there are no original black church buildings. Why? Because they started out as either uh, bush harbors, hush harbors, like in my, uh, as a tradition says it, Clinton Chapel, we started in an old shack or out in Fort Titan. And uh, we stayed there until we had enough money. You, these are slaves, ex-slaves, and uh, saved their money, put their money together, and built a church there in 1879. And in 1966, that church was torn down, and uh, we built the new edifice that you see here today. And uh, that's my family. All part of the six generations that have been members of Clinton Chapel M.A. Zion Church since the Civil War. Um, now, we'll talk about that gentleman I spoke of, George A. Rue. And keep my time, honey. <laughs> because I get carried away. But George Rue was a member of Andrew Chapel. The same, and Andrew Chapel had the largest, was the largest church around, and it had the largest number of African Americans. And uh, I think about 1850, 1840, there were almost 1,200 African American members of that church. And uh, they were drawn initially to the, to the Methodist church because they really encouraged African-Americans and the enslaved to attend their services. But, you know, as, and, and that was early on. What are we talking about? 17, 1772 to uh, uh, 1796, we got to remember that as a result of the Revolutionary War, there were a lot of emancipations, you know, the stirring rhetoric of the, uh, of the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, you know, and that sort of thing, it pricked on the conscience. And so there were more and more African Americans who were emancipated during that period. And uh, well, what happened? Well, why didn't that trend continue, Jim? Well, I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> I think it didn't continue because of one thing, the invention of the cotton gin. Yeah, there you go. 1802. Cotton gin made slavery really lucrative. Made it extremely lucrative. So lucrative that nobody was letting anybody free. And so... That's the story of how, and, and even, um, even with the, uh, uh, with the um, cotton gin, though, in the 1820s and 30s, there was the Great Awakening. It's religious. Now, man, you make me feel good. Every time I say something, you're not. I, I've got a true spirit here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the Great Awakening. You know, there were revivals all over the country. And so with that great awakening, there was more of a religious fervor in this country. And there was more of a, uh, I think, a brotherhood of equality of man. So there were some additional people let go, freed, emancipated. But uh, 
Again, we come to 1835. The state rolled back its constitution, uh, uh, enacted all kinds of restrictive laws, restricting the rights, not just of slaves, but of free blacks who had enjoyed the rights of voting for 100 years. And that's why they started voting with their feet and leaving New Bern. So a lot of that energy that they brought to the town left. And we got to remember that during this period, uh, it, uh, early uh, nation period, uh, New Bern was in its heyday. That was the golden age uh, of New Bern's development, 18, around 1800 to about 1830. 35. What happened then? Jim, you smart. Hit me again. <laughs> One of the things that happened was the um, start of iron ships, metal ships. And for those of you, I know half of you are boaters, the Noose River is very shallow. And the ships the commerce that the city enjoyed with the West Indies, with New York, Philadelphia, et cetera, that slowed down tremendously. Too shallow for the boats. For the boats. Not only that, Jim asked, well, what happened with Wilmington and New Bern? Why did they develop differently? Well, Wilmington had a deep water port. That was a major issue. The second one was that New Bern was just too laid back. <laughs> Sitting back on his laurels of the golden period, the golden era, and the gold, doesn't, the gold runs out, doesn't it, if you're not replenishing it. And what happened here in New Bern was that Wilmington, there was a Wilmington Railroad line that tied Wilmington to Raleigh and Fayetteville. Nothing came here to New Bern until 1859. So that we were, in, we were a, by, a backwater community. And, and the economic growth slowed, especially uh, since there was also a national um, recession too. So that, that's the difference between Wilmington to a great deal and, 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 and New Bern. By the time of the Civil War, Wilmington's population was twice that of New Bern. New Bern's population for about 100 years was the largest town in the state. But without a railroad, with shallow ports, it, it just restricted its, it, its ability to compete economically with other towns and cities. Now, one of the other things about New Bern and, and the difference of New Bern and Wilmington was that here in New Bern, we had the largest population of free African-Americans in the state, the very largest population. And that's why uh, Kitty and John were able to sit here with you folk and others in the Episcopalian church were able to sit with your folk, Susan, and others. So that um, as time went on, this drain, this economic drain, drained the vitality from the African-American community, although there were others who came in and who picked that up. One of the things about New Bern was that it's elite African-American community, from what I understand, according to Catherine Beisha. Anybody? Catherine Beisha? Yeah. Craft and Lies, a great book, and I urge you all to read it. Catherine says that New Bern was different from a lot of other towns because there was very little class distinction between free and enslaved. There was a, basically a philosophy, a principle that uh, your status is based on your character, how well you carry yourself, whether slave or free. And, 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 and that status is also based not so much on color, but again, on character. So that in New Bern uh, uh, versus a lot of other towns where the elite African-Americans were half white, 
uh, almost white, and uh, there was this distinction. In New Bern, that was not quite the case. And so there was a bit more harmony and cohesiveness in the African American community. Now, um, Well, it was different because, first of all, the, the large number of free African Americans who were both light and dark skinned. And uh, there were also enslaved African Americans who were able to work in this urban environment. Because there's, I think I mentioned last year, there's a difference between urban slavery and rural slavery. Urban slavery, uh, much more like a personal servant, mm -hmm. many times, or craftsman. You take your clothes to be tailored, shoes to be fixed, etc. In rural slavery, person is treated like a mule, or a horse, or, or a cow, and you work them to sun up to sun down and got all you could out of them. That was a major difference, I do believe. And then in an urban situation where you have um, the enslaved who were able to hire themselves out, then you have that co-mingling also. And I mentioned George Rue, uh, George Rue's father was a slave, but his mother was free. A lot of communities, a slave could not marry a free person. You know, that was beneath that free person's status. But, you know, love has no boundaries. And so we have that situation. All right. Again, uh, Rue, he went up to New York and he told he was a member of Andrew's Chapel and he told the people back at Andrew's Chapel, save Andrew's Chapel for me. But my good friend, my good friend, where is he? James Walker Hood came here. And James Walker Hood was an extraordinary individual. He came to New Bern, started the churches here, the North Carolina Conference, started churches in Fayetteville and Wilmington, all across this state, such that today, North Carolina has more African Methodist Episcopal Zion churches than any other state in the country. That's the work that James Walker Hood did. But Rue came and he was a little late. But Rue was a masterful speaker, a great preacher. He was a personal friend of uh, Frederick Douglass. And so he had connections too. And so he started the AME Church here in New Bern, and it's called Rue Chapel. 1865, he founded it. Uh, in 1922, the church was burned to the ground in the Great Fire. They rebuilt on the northeast corner, the northwest corner of Oak and Elm Streets. This is a church here. They, were, they rebuilt the church right across the street. In 1942, with urban renewal in the building of Craven Terrace, they condemned that church and that property. Didn't give them hardly anything for it. But the parishioners pulled together and they deconstructed that church. They deconstructed that church brick by brick, timber by timber, and moved it across the street to where it sits today. Um, that's the kind of fortitude and perseverance that we have in this city. The Baptists in New Bern. The old Eastern Missionary Baptist Association was organized at James City in 1865. And the American, African Americans withdrew from the Baptist churches across the state and established their own association, known for the time as a General Association for Colored Baptists. James City at that time 
I know you're familiar with James City to a degree. It was uh, established uh, in 1863 as the largest refugee camp in the state. Five to 10,000 people were, uh, 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 were there. And uh, it was established because when word went out that New Bern was under the control of Union forces, and this is even before the Emancipation Proclamation, the enslaved voted with their feet they escaped across swamps, woods, swam rivers to get here to New Bern because if they knew that they got to New Bern, they would be free. And over 10,000 enslaved came to New Bern. They had to find a place to get them out of. How much time I got? Okay, so I'm going to move on. I got to listen to my wife. St. John's Missionary Baptist Church. I mentioned earlier that in 1865 um, that Clinton Chapel and St. John were actually in the same prayer band. Their, their members were part of that Fort Titan group too. They just decided to go Baptist. And the Baptist uh, is the largest denomination in the state, probably in the country. And uh, they were they were uh, pretty popular, they were very popular because they did not have restrictions that some denominations have on their ministers. Having to have a the theologically trained and educated and that sort of thing. They were generally self-called. But the church purchased property in the Lone Wolf community in 1869. They built a church shortly afterwards. And this is the present church building. When it was built in 1926, it was the most beautiful Baptist church in this area. And it's still beautiful today. It's breathtaking. And you know, this is out right on the eve of the Great Depression. Church members lo almost lost the church, but they stayed the course and the uh, person who was holding the mortgage on it said, if you bring me one dollar, I will give you one dollar. And so that's how they were able to pay that beautiful church off in the midst of the Depression. And then there's First Missionary Baptist Church that was founded shortly afterwards, established in 1869, and it was named Cedar Grove Baptist Church. Uh, their church was first destroyed, and they erected a new church across the street where it's located today. In 1922, Fire destroyed all the surrounding neighborhood, and the church was open to uh, as a refugee center for the black community. A uh, couple of things have happened since that time. Uh, April uh, 2002, the church building closed for extensive repairs, and at the invitation of its downtown sister church, the congregation held Sunday worship in the chapel at First Baptist Church on Middle Street. I think we need to give First Baptist a hand. Yeah. That's what we as Christians are called to do. And they stayed there for six years. And I'm proud to say I was a planner during that time. And Mike told me, he said, can you do something about this? I said, I'll try to my best. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I did talk to the folk there they were set on tearing the church down, tearing a beautiful building down because it was so difficult to get in and out of the church, the elderly, et cetera. They'd suffered a lot of damage, but I convinced them. And so they built, you can't see it here, but they built a beautiful uh, fellowship hall on the back. And when that fellowship hall was finished in six years, they moved into the fellowship hall, left First Baptist, and then had services there for another year until the church itself, the sanctuary itself, was renovated. The other church, St. Cyprian's Episcopal Church. We got any Episcopalians here? <laughs> Nobody's admitting it? <laughs> <laughs> well, St. Cyprian's, great church. 
The black congregation was formed within Christ's Episcopal Church in 1845. By 1866, black members transferred from Christ's Episcopal to St. Cyprian's, forming the oldest and the first black Episcopal parish in North Carolina. So you see, in New Bern, we have a lot of firsts. And each one of these churches was a first. And that's the difference between Wilmington and New Bern. <laughs> you know, we're out front. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, the church replaces the former structure. It was replaced in 1910. And uh, uh, the architect was who? Herbert Simpson. That's right. And uh, you can see a beautiful church. But they've fallen on hard times due to damage by Hurricane Florence. And unfortunately, the congregation is not currently active. They had a service about a, a week or two ago, and uh, I'm going to have to speed this up. <laughs> but we're doing pretty good. And then last of all, your church, Ebenezer Presbyterian Church. 1854, the first Presbyterian church had 75 members, 12 of whom were black, <laughs> just before the Civil War. The church was established, as you know, and Mike was always proud to tell me, 1817, right? I listen to you sometime. <laughs> and uh, in 1806, continuing after the emancipation, black members attended regular services here. But in 1878, Ebenezer Colored Presbyterian Church was organized for black members. And uh, this brings a question uh, Jim Copeland asked me and said, well, what happened? Why are the churches separate? What, what made them separate? Was it that the white congregation didn't want the black congregation and the black congregation didn't want to worship in the white church or is it a combination of the two? And uh, Jim guessed it. Jim's so smart. <laughs> he guessed it. It was a combination of the two. You know, after the Civil War, there was so much acrimony uh, here across the country. You know, backlash. Uh, Southerners were mad. They lost the war and the slaves were free. Their property was free. And yeah, they tell me, well, so was mine. Uh, but we came together. And we worked out a mutual pact. They had their own church. You have to establish them. The Northern Presbyterians helped them in the building of that church. And um, I did have a, um, a, a reference. I did read your history, your Presbyterian church history. One of the good things about uh, black congregations that came out of white congregations the white congregations kept good, good records to a degree. They had people in there like you, smart people. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the records were, and uh, you got to be a little careful about how you read those records, too, you know, because we know that they are kind of tinted with the times. But that's the fact of the matter. They did, and the church was established. And that church... Had, had some great members. The most recognizable was Congressman George H. White, whose uh, house is down the street here. He was born in Baden County, moved to New Bern after studying law at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and worked as a teacher and a lawyer. He was a charter member of Ebenezer Colored Presbyterian Church. When he was elected to the U.S. House in 18... Uh, uh, 97, when he left in 1901, and he left in 1901 because, again, the state had reshaped its constitution, barring black people from voting. And his last words, George White, uh, a message to, the, uh, to his southern compatriots was, leave the South. You'll never be a man there. 
And, uh, that, you know, and this was during the News and Observer's great attack on black people, and, which initiated, ignited the Wilmington race riots and a lot of other things here. And I understand here in New Bern, there was even talk about it too, about doing something similar. But George White said they had, they, they had kind of stacked the deck against him and he had to leave because they were going to trump up charges. If you cannot vote, if you cannot be on a jury, if, what kind of justice do you have? He left and never came back. But we did have his, his offspring, um, um, what was his name? Yeah. Um, uh, we did have his offspring to come. Miss Rolett, she said she had to leave. Well, during our th 300th anniversary, uh, one of his... Oh, Stephen Graham. Stephen, yeah, Graham. Ofra's boyfriend, that's why he's known. That's why I'm known as Brenda's husband. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, he came, and, and uh, we are interested. In fact, I was in a video. I was in a, 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 in a documentary with, with, with Stedman and a couple of other people about uh, a month and a half ago, and it was shown on U, uh, uh, cable TV, on UNC TV. I'm going to have to shut this down very quickly now, but that gives you an idea of how these churches evolve, and I've got, and I'm available for some questions.